friend. I recall my discussion with my mom when I was a young girl, when she, she used to be very fascinated by one of our neighbors. There was one particular woman in our neighbor. I grew up in Morocco, by the way, so just to give you a background. And uh, this woman got married very young. She had her fourth kid before reaching her 20s. And then her husband passed away. Uh, and my mom used to find her as an exceptional woman. She used to say, look at her, she's working hard, and she's raising her children, she's, she's like a man. And in, in the eyes of my mom, this woman was exceptional because she represents what the, everything that man is. So in this event today, uh, what we're trying to do is to really look at the history, what we have failed uh, when it comes to women, and look and prepare for the present and the future where successful women will be the rule and the exception. I was looking down and it seems to be I'm the only the odd one out. If, uh, I think I'm the only man here now, and therefore it's, uh, it's a very interesting experience for me. Uh, and this actually reflects the, the background, it reflects the attitude and the mental. Uh, minds that we I have uh, inherited. But let me start by kind of uh, giving an overall introduction uh, to why you are here and what's going to break. Uh, and uh, but, uh, perhaps it would be uh, uh, transparent to tell you how excited uh, and delighted I am to see you all here this afternoon. I'm glad you are here. And I promise you, you are in for a real treat. Uh, we are, uh, and we are hoping that uh, after the champagne, uh, later on, you will leave with some ideas, and we are hoping that you will come back and try to share your experiences and what you think we should be doing. But uh, a few words about Women Quick. Uh, Women Quick is uh, a movement uh, with a clear vision. Uh, and it began its life um, by, with the idea of creating a place for uh, an honest, passionate, and uh, informed debate. This is the starting point. This is where we, uh, uh, we wish uh, we want to begin. And this is our, perhaps our second or the third uh, uh, event of that nature. And why is it? Why have we created it? Why we have thought of, 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 of doing this? Now, the idea is, the aim is that it creates a mindful and dedicated community that with the purpose of nudging history, and nudging history towards a better future of a human experience. Hence, the uh, better ideas, a better future. Uh, now, we believe, uh, and it will be interesting to see what you think, we believe by examining and challenging our inherited, mindless, uh, and sometimes faulty thoughts and assumptions and cultural background uh, that shape and inform our individual and collective uh, images concerning genders, gender differences, and the role of women uh, in, in society it should be at least looked at critically and very carefully. You might think at the beginning that what I'm telling you is quite lofty and it uh, is uh, a, a, a bit unrealistic. But uh, think with me. Our civilization, if you go back to history, to the time history was recorded, uh, our civilization uh, has uh, progressed, uh, or the story of our human story has progressed on the basis of ideas and thoughts. Everything around you, whether it's external, internal, other than the environmental things, the natural things, are actually started with an idea or a thought, or a human thought. Now, this is a powerful. Uh, but also a very elusive phenomenon to believe that with your thoughts and ideas and determination you can change the external world. Of course, you have to change also the internal self as well. But uh, the idea simply is this, that 
the ideas which you have and the thoughts are the engine that have driven human experiences. All our ideas are the engine that have driven our experiences throughout the ages. Our external and internal realities, whether it's inner or external, uh, began with an idea or a thought. Our ideas and beliefs justify, they give the justification for our actions and behavior. very athletics. I've done every sport you can imagine before uh, doing karting and then motorsport. Um, so I think I, I was meant to be uh, in, in the sports world, I would say. Um, motorsport, why motorsport? I tried, I loved it, I decided that's what I wanted to do. I was kind of a focused kid uh, when I had an idea in my head, it was not somewhere else. Um, and, and when we were talking about resilience, well, I have seen kids that were much more talented than me, with much more money than me. I have seen kids um, who, who were, you know, arriving at the track and, and, and directly understood the way it was supposed to be. Um, and, and I think the only thing I had more was, was really the fact that I, I wouldn't be able to give up. I, uh, you know, if, if I finished, la I finished actually last of my first go-kart race. I was ridiculous, like, literally. Uh, but that was a lesson. And, uh, and, and, and I was not thinking, I'm not able to do it because I'm last. I was thinking, okay, you suck. That's a fight. Uh, let's build from there. Let's, let's learn. Where, where, where did you miss something? How is it possible that you are so slow compared to the other driver? Because they are all boys, well, you have two hands, two feet, That's, th th this is not the reason, this is not the, the, the problem here. So I analyzed the problem and, and I'm like, I was 13 years old when I, you know, so uh, no, with, with the, the old story I can analyze it, but uh, it was much more chaotic in my head at that time. Um, I was just thinking, you can do it. There is no reason you cannot do it. So why don't you do it? Why are you not fast enough? And the race after was a little bit better, and, and so on and so on. Um, so resilience is, is not just, you know, oh, I knew I was the best and I failed because of something external to me. No, so most of the time you fail because of you. And it's actually this time that it's much more difficult to stand up after it and go on. In, and go over it because it's really easier to project your failure on other people or their external reason. It's much more difficult to accept that you are the own reason of your failure, but that's also the best way to actually improve yourself and stand up to the next level, let's say. No, we'll stop here. Women have actually some skills, some approach that's a little bit different and that brings much more than just being good for the image. Um, so for me that was very, very important and uh, I'm actually very happy and proud that I demonstrate it every day in, in what I'm doing. Um, one of the questions you asked me when I arrived was about discrimination and, and if I experienced it a, lo a lot in, uh, in, uh, in motorsport. Uh, well, you can imagine that the guys are not very happy about having a woman racing faster than them, so for sure they're not always very happy about this. Um, but discrimination, no, I, I just don't let it happen. And I think that's the best behavior you can have in terms of discrimination between men and women. I know it's easier to say than to do it, um, but it's actually possible in some case. And what is very important is that you stand up uh, when you have the opportunity to do it. It's not always the case, but that's life. Uh, but sometimes you can stand up, sometimes you can actually show better, and, and I think it's, it's important. So, tonight, ask me any question. For me, there is no taboo, I have no problem to you know, debate, and uh, I know my ideas are a little bit sometimes straight to the point. I have no problem to hear to other ones. Uh, and of course, I can talk only from my experience, and the world I'm evolving in is very, very specific. It's, it's a sport. It's a business because there is a lot of money involved, 
but uh, I know it's it's, it's not the, the rule everywhere in the, in, in, in the business world, I would say so. I, I know I don't have answer to everything, <laughs> don't, don't misunderstand me, but if I can give a little bit, well, I'm happy to do it, and especially if I can learn from you, I'm even happier. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm really proud to be in front of uh, such a nice audience. Uh, my name is Yiva, like the brand. Um, four years ago, I quit, as he introduced me, I quit a career that was working quite well. I was uh, quite successful, but I, there was something missing. And I decided I, that I would pursue my dream. And my dream was basically to work in fashion and develop my own brand and have a platform to express myself. And the whole, the, the thing is that, okay, yes, where is the trick there? The trick was that I had no idea where I was going. I never attended a fashion school. I never worked in fashion. I knew nothing. I had no contact. I really scratch. I started from scratch. Like, I had this notebook, and even to get some design, I was like terrified. But kind of, um, it was. It became like a call that I had to listen, and it became obvious that it was really something I wanted to do. So what I'm usually telling people when they ask me, but why fashion? I mean, it's quite superficial. Why do you make it something so essential in your life? And my answer is. Usually that I deeply and strongly believe that it has nothing to do only with fashion. It has to do with you finding your purpose. I mean, I for me it was fashion because the first time I opened a fashion magazine, I was just five. Um, and it was like time stopped and I was looking at all these images and could realize that this creative process was amazing like someone started with just an idea and he came up with you know the clothes the, the whole image and the whole atmosphere and had something to tell and for me it was really attractive and, and then the second thing i usually tell to people is that we all have that we all have received something maybe a passion a talent or an interest or anything that really tickles you and comes back to you and I think it's our job in that or our duty to pursue that thing and to listen to that thing. So once you have that call and that you feel that there's something you want to do, just listen to it. Because the second thing is that it has to be big. It has to be to look impossible to shake you. It has to be like, okay, what am I going to do? Because the bigger it is, the more exciting it becomes because you have to push the limits in order to actually discover your own potential. I think that when you... People don't usually tell you tell young, young girls that they can dream big, but I think it's our duty to tell the new generation that there, there are really no limits. We can be presidents, we can, we can drive huge companies, we can do anything you, we want. It has just to be something that you really want to do. And then it's your job to find, to be creative, to find a good context to get there. And then the third thing that I learned from this whole journey, and this may be the reason why I'm in front of all of you, is that um, actually it's all about connections. It's all about, yes, we were talking about networking, but I think this journey was really, um, it was not my personal journey. It became like, um, how do you say, um, me opening up to people, meeting people, learning from people, growing in a way that I wasn't expecting. And people can always, when, you're, when you express things in a very authentic way, it resonates with people. They say, I could, they, they feel that they could be you. So they kind of start to think about ideas or people that could help you. And that's what opened doors to me that I wasn't expecting. Like one, one or two months ago, I was in the Vogue UK, and for I was almost crying because for the little girl of five who opened that magazine, to see one of her designs such a huge and recognized magazine, it was just 
an achievement in such and and I think you have to find a way to share your dreams with people because when people are afraid to share their ideas and everything but once you talk, start to share really the your objectives and what you want, what is driving you it's it creates a kind of energy that drives people that inspires people and actually what is it it is it's not about you it's about what what you create the drive you create from a bigger perspective so thank you I'm just a woman. Euh, enfin, j'ai un parcours très atypique. Euh, C'est pour ça que je, je le raconte rarement, mais ça m'a dit tu dois raconter ton parcours parce que ça, on n'a jamais vu. Donc, euh, donc, ce soir, je vous raconte mon parcours. Donc, au départ, je suis infirmière. Alors, j'ai voulu faire le métier d'infirmière parce que j'aimais bien aider les autres et je me suis dit, ben, ça, c'est un métier pour moi. Et donc, euh, j'ai fait mes études d'infirmière, c'était très dur parce que euh, on m'a dit plusieurs fois, oui, mais tu sais, Lina, tu fais le graduat, mais tu dois peut-être aller voir le brevet. Enfin, je ne sais pas pourquoi c'était les études les plus dures de ma vie, alors qu'après, vous allez voir, j'ai fait plein de choses. Euh, donc, j'ai été infirmière et puis euh, j'ai euh, travaillé euh, chez Pfizer, qui est une firme, une firme américaine. J'ai travaillé dans la recherche clinique, donc euh, j'ai été spécialisée euh, de Pfizer, euh, états unis en recherche clinique. Euh, et ensuite, justement, on travaillait nous sur euh, des... Euh, c'était les tests juste après les animaux. Donc c'était les médicaments qui étaient testés juste après, euh, là, en phase 1. Donc le premier test humain qui se fait sur des volontaires, donc euh, des personnes saines. Et euh, au bout de deux ans, j'étais devenue manager et tout, euh, c'était très bien. Euh, mais euh, je me suis dit, ben moi, j'ai fait infirmière pour aider les autres et pas forcément pour... Euh, j'avais besoin du contact humain et j'avais besoin de pouvoir avoir un impact. Et, euh, et donc, euh, voilà, j'ai été très vite recrutée par euh, le centre du cancer de Saint-Luc. Et je vous raconte ça parce que ça a changé ma vie. Euh, j'ai euh, travaillé donc, euh, longtemps dans, comme coordinatrice de recherche clinique, mais plutôt alors sur des patientes, puisque j'étais spécialisée en gynécologie et tout ce qui était cancer du sein et cancer de l'utérus. Et euh, au bout d'un an, euh, j'ai suivi mes patientes et elles ont commencé à décéder. Euh, il y avait des patients jeunes, des patients plus âgés, euh, c'était émotionnellement très fort. Et je me suis interrogée sur le sens de la vie. Qu'est-ce que moi j'aimerais vraiment réaliser dans ma vie finalement Qu'est-ce qui vaut Qu'est-ce qui ferait que ma vie euh, vaudrait la peine d'être vécue Et euh, on a bénéficié du plan cancer, c'était le plan fédéral, là, un plan politique qui nous a donné beaucoup de moyens pour la recherche et qui a permis d'engager aussi plusieurs personnes qui ont aidé les familles. Enfin voilà, on a mis plein de choses en place grâce à ce plan cancer. Et moi qui ne votais pas avant, je me suis dit « Waouh, c'est ça la politique <rire> !» Parce que ça permettait d'activer des leviers importants et de pouvoir toucher beaucoup de monde en même temps. Et donc c'était plus moi à l'infirmière avec un patient, mais c'était des centaines de milliers de personnes qui étaient touchées par des politiques publiques. Et donc je me suis dit « C'est ça que je veux faire. » Je veux être acteur de changement, je veux pouvoir aussi participer à une meilleure société. Et donc, euh, bah, moi qui étais infirmière, bah, forcément, je me regarde, c'est ma copine, et c'était, elle bah, jamais raconté tout ça. <rire> Bon, moi, comme infirmière, je ne connais pas trop comment fonctionne la société, donc euh, j'ai été, euh, été faire un master en sciences politiques, économiques et sociales à Rivalade-Neuve, et j'ai dû changer de boulot puisque je travaillais comme infirmière le soir, le week-end, euh, euh, voilà. Alors j'ai été euh, infirmière de crèche, et puis directrice d'une crèche. C'était des années passionnantes où je me suis vraiment bien amusée et euh, j'ai été très conscientisée à la cause de la petite enfance. Justement, tout à l'heure, la Nalélis parlait du congé de paternité, de la conciliation entre la vie privée et la vie professionnelle. Mais quand vous vivez là-dedans, vous vous rendez compte que, que c'est voilà, une vraie cause, ça dépend. Et, euh, et donc, voilà, donc j'ai commencé ce master sans penser moi-même faire de la politique à un moment, en me disant, moi, la politique publique, ça me va très bien. Et euh, bah, on fait une première année, bah, on se commence, hein, les russes commencent à monter en soi. Et, euh, et puis on se dit, euh, allez, à l'unif, on me disait, oui, le maître doit penser à faire de la politique. Et moi je disais, moi, jamais, non. <rire> Alors très vite, ça m'a rattrapé. Donc euh, j'ai euh, regardé un peu tous les programmes politiques, j'ai regardé dans quelle partie je pourrais m'investir, euh, qui me plairait le plus, qui avait des valeurs qui se rapprochaient des miennes. Euh, bah, très bien euh, porté sur euh, l'humain et l'humanisme. Et donc euh, j'ai choisi un parti et j'ai commencé chez les jeunes. 
euh, du parti avec des activités avec les jeunes et puis après j'ai très vite été repérée et, euh, et, euh, et très vite ça s'est enchaîné puisqu'il y a eu des élections en 2012 que j'ai eu l'honneur de faire à la ville de Bruxelles avec Dormia, c'est un très beau souvenir, on s'est très bizarre de parler de ça ce soir et euh, mais c'est comme ça que j'ai rencontré Bianca bien à l'époque déjà et euh, et ensuite, euh, très vite, ça s'est enchaîné puisque j'ai Céline Frigo qui est une ministre de l'économie. Donc j'ai intégré son cabinet, je finissais mes études. Euh, et voilà, et alors après, euh, je ne suis plus sortie de là. Jusqu'à un moment, bah, j'ai été aussi euh, bah, chez la ministre de l'égalité des chants et de l'intérieur. Je l'ai suivie quand elle a été ministre de l'éducation et de la culture et de l'enfance. Et donc j'ai récupéré à ce moment-là la compétence en France, ce qui m'a ravie. Euh, je me suis bien amusée aussi. Mais entre-temps, bah, en passant par le cabinet euh, de l'économie, je me suis prise, moi qui avais fait déjà quand même sur Seco, je me suis prise d'une vraiment autre passion pour euh, Bruxelles et pour euh, les entrepreneurs. Et je me suis dit, bah, c'est un monde que j'aimerais bien explorer aussi. Et quand j'étais euh, au cabinet de l'enfance et de l'éducation, euh, je me suis dit, bah, j'irais bien faire une année, euh, un troisième cycle à Solvay, en business management, pour mieux comprendre le monde des entrepreneurs. <rire> je vois, elle dit aussi, elle me regarde. <rire> C'est vrai que c'est le copine, mais c'est juste qu'elle ne va jamais raconter tout ça. Et, euh, et donc je me suis dit, bah, j'aimerais bien comprendre leur monde, comment justement ça fonctionne, et comment fonctionne l'entreprise, et, et comment, voilà, comment les choses se font. Donc quand j'ai fait ce, ce master en management, ça franchement c'est quelque chose qui, je pense, qui m'a qui beaucoup aidé, dans, dans mon, même dans mon développement personnel. Parce que forcément c'est un autre monde, entre le monde politique et le monde de l'économie, de l'entrepreneuriat. Mais voilà, c'est un monde qui est très ouvert, euh, comme aujourd'hui, c'est un monde qui est international, c'est un monde euh, qui, euh, voilà, qui, qui est très dynamique, qui est très inspirant aussi, comme les entrepreneurs ce soir, et même celles qui sont dans la salle, euh, parce qu'il y a beaucoup de successful women ce soir dans la salle. Et, euh, et donc voilà, et donc après, je me suis dit, bah, avec tout ça, finalement, un jour, tu vas pouvoir faire quelque chose, mais j'ai toujours été une, une militante active des droits des femmes, et euh, quand j'ai vu euh, qu'à la région bruxelloise, ils cherchaient quelqu'un pour euh, coordonner la plateforme Women in Business, je me suis dit « Ah, mais ça, c'est un truc pour moi, ça <rire> !» Et donc voilà, c'est comme ça que j'ai atterri chez Impulse euh, à l'époque, qui est aujourd'hui Up Brussels, donc, euh, qui est l'agence bruxelloise pour l'accompagnement d'entreprise. Et je me suis dit que c'était une super occasion pour pouvoir allier bah, déjà toutes mes compétences, mais aussi pour pouvoir euh, bah, allier tous mes combats. Donc euh, un combat pour, euh, pour les femmes, pour plus d'autonomie des femmes, pour euh, leur donner l'autonomie financière, pour pouvoir aussi euh, bah, les soutenir dans leurs projets, dans leurs rêves, puisque l'entrepreneuriat, comme on le voit ce soir, c'est aussi la réalisation d'un rêve. Et, euh, et en plus, ça permettait de, faire, de continuer à faire des politiques publiques et de pouvoir continuer d'être un acteur de changement. Et donc, euh, bah, au fil de, des mois, L'activité a grossi, aujourd'hui on est dépassé par notre succès, puisque l'année passée, en 2017, on a, été, on a eu 3000 participants à nos activités. On a fait plus de 40 activités dans l'année. Uh, my question is for Sarah. Can I call you Sarah? Sure. Yeah, you know, go for it. Jesus, come on. Like, I thought of you, know, you in technology, but it must be like zero, zero, zero percent of women in investing. So what got you started? Like, what? Where did you go? So I wanna, I wanna change careers now. <laughs> I wanna become an eraser. All right. So where should I go? You know what? That's that's actually the question. Sorry. That's actually the question that everybody is asking me. Guys, girls, younger, older, I, okay, how, how do I go to be a racing driver? Um, so, they, it's, it's not like football, uh, where basically you start in a club with, uh, you know, provincial competition and there is an, a very clear path uh, with different divisions and that kind of thing. Uh, racing is chaotic. Uh, you have to find your way. Um, my story, personally, is that I started with go-kart quite late, because normally you start a go-kart around 5 or 6 years old, I was 12. Um, I did only 2 years, because I wanted to catch that uh, delay, and also because I didn't have that much money, and I uh, couldn't find some sponsor for go-kart. So at uh, 14, 15 years old, I participated to a competition uh, to, to, to find some young talent, 
Uh, it was organized by the, the National uh, Authority of Racing in Belgium and uh, Renault, the, the car manufacturer. Um, and they were basically doing open competition for anybody in karting that wanted to switch to single-seater, which is really like the first step of motorsport for young talent. Um, I finished third um, out of thousands of guys, and they were taking the two first. Yeah. But like, that was really the, the worst spot. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, being the only woman in the competition and everything, I was kind of spotted you know, by some team and sponsors. Um, so I had the chance to do the two first race. I was leading the championship after that. Uh, so again, I was noticed. Um, and each time I was... Any opportunity I had to be on the racetrack, I was going. Sometimes I was spending the whole day in the rain with no certitude that I was going to drive something. I was just there, waiting. Just in case someone, you know, leave a car over there, maybe I can jump in and show a little bit what I can do. Um, that's my story because I didn't have any uh, family money. A lot of young drivers, they have at least a little bit of help from their parents. In my case, it was not possible, so I really had to, you know, force my destiny, <laughs> let's say. Um, so I started like that, and um, a few competitions later, I received a phone call from a Belgian car manufacturer, Gilles Vertigo. Um, maybe some of you know, it's the only Belgian car brand. Um, and he told me, Sarah, I want you to race Spa 24 Hours with my car. Uh, Spa 24 Hours is the biggest GT race in the world. It's an international competition. So far, I just did some national races. And I said, yes, I had absolutely no idea uh, what it was going to be like. I never raced that kind of car. And at 18 years old, I was the youngest driver to ever raced in that competition. Not, not woman. Any, uh, any driver. Um, and that was, that was my launch, you know? That was my launch, and after that I just had a lot of wins and fails, ups and downs, and, and, and I just keep going. 